little bit about who we are and what we do, and then we'll kind of get into the meat of today's presentation. Um, I will say that Julianne and I really want and encourage you guys to be conversational and ask questions. You can certainly use the chat function at the bottom if you have ideas or thoughts or questions, um, or please just feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Um, we want everyone to get what they need from, from today and get some good ideas. So um, please don't hesitate to, to ask questions and, and kind of speak up. Um, <clears throat> so a little bit about us, We, as, as Stacy mentioned, we are both, um, we both work for family centers. The Center for Hope, which I manage and run, is um, a grief and bereavement resource center for the most part, although we do see a wide range of issues and things, um, you know, in terms of anxiety and relationship issues, et cetera, et cetera. We function as a general clinic as well. But we offer many different bereavement groups and uh, grief counseling uh, to families and individuals. And um, as I, I imagine many of you know, Family Centers is just a really large nonprofit with many different programs in the community, including Julianne's program, which is the Denver Grieving Kids. Yes, so the Denver Grieving Kids is our family bereavement program. Um, Pre-COVID, we meet on Monday or Wednesday nights every <laughs> other week. Um, and we have groups all the way from ages three um, through teenage years for young adults, and of course for adults as well, for spousal loss, child loss, um, general loss and Spanish speaker Spanish speaker groups as well. And then we also have our school-based programming, which typically we go into the schools during the school day pre-COVID, but right now those are also running virtually via Zoom. So we have groups for elementary, middle, high school, and community college age kids. Um, and it's all grief and bereavement support and run by wonderful volunteers who are trained quarterly to keep up on best practices. Um, and so it's a, a great program if I do say so myself, but we're able to service um, a large age group in that, in that program. And it's free as well. So I should mention that's a, that's a big point. <laughs> um, so I think that's in some ways a perfect segue. There's kind of two pieces to today's presentation. Um, the first is kind of around COVID, right? Um, and how Julian and I see uh, the pandemic um, through a grief lens. And the second piece is a little bit more playful and fun around kind of creative ways and different things we can do to um, help create uh, meaningful holidays given the pandemic. So um, bear with us a bit for the beginning portion. Um, I, I think it's really important to start here because, you know, obviously Julianne and I work in the grief and bereavement field. And when the pandemic first started, we really began considering and viewing the pandemic very much through a grief lens. And I think it's why I wanted to start here is because I think in order to really have perspective and have meaningful holidays, you also need to allow yourself the understanding of what the pandemic has been for all of us in some ways, right? And different families in different ways. But really, when we say we work in the grief world, we, we obviously very much work in terms of physical loss, right? When when people lose loved ones in their lives. But the reality I think is what we're finding with this pandemic is that the grief and loss um, that we're experiencing now is more of a collective loss, right? And so kind of a community collective loss of normalcy, of routines, of structure, of control, right? Um, so many things in our life have been impacted families in different ways, right? Um, but it's really important to recognize that these milestones and traditions that we have lost or that have changed or have been altered, really, you have to be begin to understand that through a grief perspective for yourself and for your family um, so that we can kind of understand and move forward, right? Um, Julianne, go ahead. Say more on that, please. Um, and so we kind of move into this idea of identifying and naming our losses, but also keeping in mind this idea of comparative suffering. And the idea of comparative suffering is, it really goes into the, the point of not using dismissive language when we're talking within our family unit or when we're talking to friends and neighbors. And so some examples of this are, even though you have warm food on the table or a roof over your head, it's still okay to feel the losses from these 
from this pandemic. It's okay to feel that loss of normalcy, loss of routine, um, loss of you know socialization with your family and friends. Those are really important. And then naming that, it allows our children to also name their losses and feel okay within their own losses. And the comparative suffering piece really comes into play when we say, you know, I'm really struggling with this. This online learning is really hard, but it could always be worse. And if we're always kind of diminishing our own losses and our own experiences, it really closes the door for others um, to kind of open those conversations with us, including our own children. So we really want to hear those losses, be able to name them and talk about them, give our kids language to talk about them, um, and, and not diminish them for ourselves. Sometimes that's little... Um, kind of like a defense tactic um, to kind of make ourselves feel better, make ourselves feel more in control or more secure. But it's okay that this loss of normalcy and kind of this collective loss is affecting us in this way. It's it, why I think it's so important is is a piece of this is for our children, right? Because I think we we function in this in this place sometimes of, you know, we're just trying to get through, we're surviving, it, you know, we're just doing the best. And while all that's true, it's equally as important to sometimes pause and, as Julianne said, just also acknowledge and name. Um, the loss that people have experienced, right? And those losses for your kids can be something as simple as really missing, you know, going to the bus stop and chatting with friends at the bus stop. You know, that's that can still be a significant loss that we can identify and name for our kids, even though it's it's very different from well, my well, my uncle died from COVID, right? You know, so there's there's different levels, of course, but all are equally important to kind of identify in your families. Um, and, and in some ways, we're, we want to give kids permission to feel those things and name them, um, which can be really profound and valuable um, in families. So, you know, one of the things we say with kids is, is, um, is helping them have that concrete language, right? For kids especially, but, but for all of us, so much of this pandemic is a loss of control, right? And so, um, while we can't, I, I often say this to my own kids, right? Like while we can't, um, while we shouldn't or while we can't focus on what we can't control, sometimes for kids, it's really important to focus on what we can control, right? And so in naming these losses and identifying these things, it's also very important to give them permission to have control over certain things, right? And so for little kids, for, for big kids, whatever that may be, that may be something as simple allowing them to choose what they want for dinner, right? Or allowing them to choose their book, book story for story time at night. You know, it's, often in a situation like this, where there's just really collective loss of control in a society or in a family, so, mu so much of what can help children is offering them opportunities, even though they're small opportunities and might seem really minuscule to, to seem as if they have more control than they actually really do. That can really help combat anxiety um, for kids especially. Absolutely. And I think it's important to touch on the fact that a lot of times as parents or people working with children, we kind of assume that we know best or know what they need or want. And within these choices, it's really important to give kids choices around what they want to do for the holidays. I think as parents, of course, you want to give yourself and your family and your kids the best holiday possible. And you want to make sure, you know, it looks as uh, similar to last year or the holidays before that as possible. But your kids might not feel comfortable with that. Um, they might be feeling a little bit nervous around COVID and around gathering. So while we might want to make it uh, similar to last year for them and gather with family and just kind of push through and um, make it familiar and comfortable, that might not be okay with them. And, and given the choice of, do you want to, you know, go to grandma and grandpa's for Thanksgiving dinner, or would you feel more comfortable staying home with just our family? They might surprise you and say, I think it would feel better to stay home. And so not assuming that we know what our kids need or want right now, and just making it more of a family conversation with lots of choices. And like Chelsea said, that can be a really small choice of, do you want eggs or toast for breakfast? Do you want to wear this red shirt or blue shirt or something as big as, as a family, what do we think we want to do for the holidays? 
it, I think it's a really important point with this holiday conversation because often so much of the holiday planning falls on the parents, right? And our kids just follow in suit. Um, <laughs> it can be really in, you can kind of skip this for next year and the years forward, but in this year specifically, just having the conversation about what your kids feel comfortable about um, and acknowledging, you know, we're really big believers in the grief world that no person grieves in the same way in a family, right? And that each family experience and each personal experience um, for that griever is going to be different and look different. If it's a really important piece of grief work, because people think that, you know, you just, you know, you do X, Y, and Z and you get to, you know, it, in the reality is in grief, it just doesn't flow that way, right? Very, the parallel process for this pandemic grief, if you will, is very, is very similar. And so it's important to know that if, if you have four kids, each of those kids may feel a little bit different and honoring those differences and listening to them and acknowledging them, even if you don't make them decisions based off them. But if you give your kids the voice to express their own concerns, or maybe they're not concerned or, you know, whatever that may be is, is can be really, really helpful and, and powerful for them. Um, I think the other piece of this is that we've been doing this for a long time, right? And we have come up with creative ways to kind of survive and make do, you know, car parades for birthdays, different things that, I mean, the Halloween, some, you know, the most creative situations for Halloween that neighbors and people did in my neighborhood was incredible, right? And so while also honoring and hearing the losses, focusing on some perspective and resilience with your kids um, can be really important as well. Absolutely. And then moving into that communication piece, Chelsea. Yeah. I think, um, you know, we were talking a little bit about this before the call officially started. I think we, and this is, it's another parallel between physical loss and kind of what we're going through right now. Um, when we lose people and people die, we tend to kind of glorify them in their passing. And I think that's a little bit of what's happening with the holidays right now. It's something that we can't have. It's something that isn't going to look like last year's holidays or the holidays prior or all the traditions we have. And we're kind of glorifying the holidays in our mind. And I think if we take a step back, um, we notice that or realize that the holidays aren't always perfect. And there's a lot of stressful parts to the holidays. And I think kind of looking on the bright side of COVID, it gives us an opportunity this year to kind of strip all of that away and focus on our you know, individual family units and prioritize what we want and need moving into this holiday season. So I know like when COVID first started, we were talking about this new normal and you know, all, everything got stripped away and we're focusing on what's so important. As Chelsea said, we've been in this for a while now. So it's kind of become normalized. And I think the holidays are another hump where we're kind of like, this is not normal. This is very much not normal at all. And so it's another opportunity to kind of realize what has been stripped away and how to move through that in a positive, positive way. I think it's, I just want to just stop for a moment. Do, does anybody have any thoughts or questions on this idea that Julianne and I are sharing about viewing the pandemic through a grief lens? Does that make sense to people? Have people heard that before? You know, some we've, we've heard that some people have found that comforting, you know, to give yourself permission to really grieve and honor that there is loss and collective loss in all of this. It's been very scary, very impactful for many families in many, many ways. And sometimes I think we so function as parents and families in survival mode that we almost don't acknowledge how much has happened and how much we have lost. So any any kind of thoughts or, or feedback or questions around that that lens of viewing the pandemic through through the through grief. And it's okay if you don't and certainly feel free if you want to say anything regarding that to put that in the chat. But um, I just want to make sure that people really kind of hear that and in in you know have questions if they yeah please Allie please um sorry I, I know I look I just walked the dog some drenched in sweat here um I would <laughs> say you know personally I have not lost anyone to COVID mm -hmm. um but I know someone who has and I, I think if you had lost someone you might feel differently but I appreciate what you guys are doing because mm -hmm. my kids I've got twins in fifth grade and it's um 
a regular, this isn't fair. I don't like it. Why can't I do anything? Oh my gosh, so-and-so is doing that. Why can't I do that? And I'm not paranoid, but I'm also like, you're not going to sign up for an indoor basketball clinic with all different towns. I'm sorry. Like I have to know the line somewhere. So um, I appreciate what you guys are saying. And I think for the kids, they probably can yeah relate to that better because for them it's a loss right um of, of the life they've known but um yeah so I don't know no Ali that's a really great point it's it's come up in a lot of other presentations or like but I do know someone that actually suffered a physical loss and is this fair to kind of make this comparison and when this all first started as you know Chelsea and I work in grief and bereavement and we were hearing from people who had lost someone, not to COVID, just lost them yeah. in general before the pandemic happened, they were like, this feels really similar to grief. And it's kind of how this whole idea and kind of how we got started on this, because um, it really does feel similar. And so people who have lost loved ones um, have almost given us permission to utilize this language and to think of it yeah. in this capacity. And of course, we want to be sensitive to to that and people who have suffered not only a physical loss during COVID, but due to COVID. Um, but I think it's kind of this, this great equalizer, this pandemic. Yeah. And it's like, even the people who have suffered a physical loss, they're also suffering from these collective and secondary losses as well. So it's something we're all experiencing at many, many different levels. So I definitely hear that and appreciate that. Right, and, and uh, Ali, I think it's just a really valid point. And I think it's, we wanna be careful to ignite. I, I am someone who has had a physical loss during this time, right? And so in no way is, am I comparing the loss of my loved one to also the loss of what I've experienced through COVID. But there are these framework similarities in, in what we experience, especially as you said, for our children to understand um, and, and just honor that there is this sense of loss and normalcy that very much parallels, maybe not in intensity, right? right? But the but parallel, the exactly, exactly, exactly. And in some ways, I, I think what Julianne and I want to do is offer permission for you guys to kind of view it through this lens um, because I think we have to in order to kind of move forward and to build perspective and resilience and be okay with the holidays we also have to know in our families what we're dealing with right and we're dealing with loss questions other other thoughts anyone please feel free thank you Ali for sharing that really appreciate it um, okay, so so the next kind of piece of this then is, as Julianne mentioned, communication, right? Um, we can't we we can't assume that every family functions well at the holidays, right? The holidays can be really complicated in general um, for many families. Not every family comes from this beautiful, perfect, happy-go-lucky family, and so you throw a wrench into some of these situations and that may really stir up complications for families, right? And so one of the things that Julianne and I have really talked about and focused on with the people we work with is, is communication, right? And I imagine many of you are experienced as, as we're two weeks from Thanksgiving, yeah. you know, I, in my own family, the uh, conversation about Thanksgiving and plans has, is exhausting in some ways, right? And so I think what we want to kind of really drive home is it is crucial in times of change and disruption to communicate and to overly communicate and to um, to have a plan A, to have a plan B, and to have a plan C, right, within your family dynamic. We are not the COVID police here, right, and so we fully understand why we're going to offer you guys some interesting creative ideas and thoughts. Um, we also understand that people may still get together in, in that people have different family circumstances and, and, and um, views and um, wishes for their family, and that's completely okay. What we're suggesting, however, is that given the pandemic, anything can change, right? And so really ironing out your own nuclear family boundaries and family interests is, I think, a priority. Um, as Julianne was kind of saying right before we kind of got into this piece, it's an, it's an opportunity to really scale back and examine your nuclear family and really what the priorities and importance is for just your immediate family before then expanding to your um, extended family, right? Because I think it, it perhaps makes it easier if you really as a cohort, as a family and a nuclear family, understand 
understand the wishes and the priorities within your family first so that you can then present that to your extended family. I, I think the other piece is um, knowing that there may be drama, right? And there may be extended family that may not be pleased with the fact mm -hmm. that you are going to just stay home, the four of you, and that's your plan. Um, they may be offended, right? They may not agree with that. And in some ways, it's an opportunity to know that the pandemic kind of gives an excuse to, well, this is our choice and this is what we're doing and this is we feel safe with in giving yourself permission and your family to know that that's okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so we are going to kind of move into some creative ideas here for the holidays. We actually have a whole holiday playbook that Stacey is going to send out after this presentation with tons and tons of ideas. So we're just going to touch on like two or three for each um, holiday and, and season coming up. Um, I just, the, the one thing I want to say before we go into some of the ideas is a lot of these ideas reflect on principles around gratitude and service and um, family connection, right? And I think it's just important. The reason Julianne and I kind of created it in this way is because the very stark reality is the holidays are going to look different, right? And what we're trying to create is another narrative around how families can stay connected right and stay um you know so if we're not you know in my family christmas is a you know 40 person get together that clearly can't happen right we have many ill family members there's varying ages that's devastating right that is a loss for me i feel very sad about that so then how can i stay connected right and how can my kids feel connected to their cousins and things like that um a lot of them are very silly ideas right and a lot of them play on um, almost examples or ideas from other holidays like Valentine's Day, right? Or things like that, right? Um, so I think that's our, our message here is how, even though your holidays are gonna look really different, how can you kind of bring creativity so that um, the, the, the loss felt is a little bit less, if that makes sense. Um, I, go ahead, Julianne, please. I think another way that, um again, this parallel between COVID and collective loss and physical loss is often people experiencing grief and loss, their kind of first round of holidays, their first year of grief and bereavement, all of the traditions get thrown out the window. And they're like, this is too hard. It's too reminiscent of what was and what could be. And so this year we're going to kind of just scratch it and do something else. And so these ideas are also ideas that we've heard from people who are experiencing physical losses and ways that their family is celebrating that isn't reminiscent or isn't a reminder of holidays with their loved ones. And you'll kind of see that. It's like, if you try to recreate what Thanksgiving or Christmas looked like last year, it might kind of fall flat and feel disappointing because you're like, there's no way this could measure up in the age of COVID. So moving away from some of those traditions and maybe starting something new can actually be helpful and kind of help it feel a little fresh and new and not like you're trying to recreate what it could look like, if that makes sense. I also think it's just important in one of the presentations we've done previously, um, a lady said, you know, it's really helpful for me to think of it just as this is just one year. Right. And it, I, for me, that was even helpful um, because the reality is we don't know what the next couple of years look like, but let's hope to goodness, right, that we have less loss and change in our lives and disruption next holiday season than this. I think the only place that that really gets complicated, what we've heard from people, and I imagine many of you might be in this situation, is when there are older family members, right, or ill family members, right, and when the thought process is, um, this could be my last holiday with this family member, right? And one of the other very powerful things, and Julian, you might want to touch on this better than I can, but that also is a real experience of people who are who who have a sudden loss, right? And Julian, I, you said something eloquently about this before. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just for a little bit of self-disclosure, I myself lost my dad. It'll be five years in April. And that is another parallel. I feel like we keep bringing up all these parallels, but there are many. 
um, that physical loss grievers experience, kind of this fear of, of, well, it could be the last. And that's a very real feeling and really difficult feeling. And so it's, there's two pieces to that. Again, Chelsea and I are not the COVID police. If your family feels that it's really imperative and important to spend time with those older family members, then you and your family unit can find a safe and comfortable way to do that. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side of that is kind of knowing that that might be the case and that's really scary. And how do we still make the best of this holiday? And how do we still include them in a way that feels comfortable for everybody in, involved? And so again, just another parallel that, that it is a real fear that physical loss grievers experience almost every holiday season. It's kind of something that taints it moving forward. And um, there's definite ways to kind of move through this with your family unit in whatever way you deem best. And also, I think it's a practice in because we just never know, right? If COVID's taught us nothing, um, it's it's that we just never know. And so, how can we also, as a family unit, be more present in our lives, right? With our loved ones that we're nervous might not be here next year, right? How you know that goes far beyond just a holiday season, right? And I think that's kind of some of the messaging we want to share is that while the holidays of course are crucial and so important for so many of us, there's also ways in your life to um, have meaning and connection to your loved ones um, beyond this holiday season. Absolutely. Taking a little pressure off the day itself and knowing that you can extend these graces and connection to people far beyond the holiday. I think that's a great point. I know many of you have to kind of pick up pick up your kids perhaps at 10, 15, 10, 20. So I just want, before we kind of get into some of the creative fun stuff, and, and we're hoping that you guys um, will share some of your own ideas or thoughts um, in the chat box too, if, if you have started talking about some of these things with your with your families and what you're doing for Thanksgiving and Christmas. And um, also really important to recognize that we understand there's other holidays other than Thanksgiving and Christmas and that many families, Jewish families and, and all the, uh, you know, all sorts of families celebrate um, holidays differently and also there's different cultures but a lot of our um, ideas and suggestions are kind of specifically focused around Thanksgiving and Christmas um, but can be adaptable to any holiday and cultural situation but so far any any thoughts kind of on the grief lens and then on the communication having many plans and um, any other thoughts before we get into the creative piece Okay. Um, so when we did this before, a lot of our ideas were for Halloween, but that holiday has come and gone. Um, so we're not going to share any, any thoughts for Halloween, but I will share that. Um, what, what I have found when Stacy sends out our holiday playbook, um, it will include some ideas for Halloween. I hope that some of the things that I saw with my neighbors remain for future Halloweens. You know, um, we did a pinata with my my toddlers and cousins. That was like a, a win in a great, very random idea that I got from Pinterest that had nothing to do with Halloween, but really worked and they loved, you know, people doing the, um, the, the candy shoots and the little bags in front. You know, there were really um, some very special ideas that perhaps may last for future Halloweens. We, we don't know, but. Um, we'll move into Thanksgiving, Julian, if you want to start. Yeah, of course. Um, so again, you're going to get this holiday playbook with tons of ideas. We'll just touch on a few. Uh, but some good ones I've heard are kind of let it, instead of Thanksgiving dinner, just kind of scratching that menu and allowing kids to pick one dish that they really want to eat that day. It could be an ice cream sundae. It could be macaroni and cheese. It could be whatever they want. And then kind of your family makes their own really fun menu. Um, again, maybe a tradition that only lasts this one year, but could still be really fun. <laughs> uh, a lot of families are doing virtual turkey trots. My family is not a turkey trot family, thank goodness. But if you are um, doing a virtual 5K, kind of sharing your times and being able to send a prize to the winner. And that can go from state to state, town to town. You could e even gather safely and still do that Thanksgiving morning. 
Um, and another idea I really liked for Thanksgiving was a canned food drive and having friends and family, like picking a day for the, everyone to come and drop it off, almost like a car parade, but for canned goods. And then you and your family kind of bringing that somewhere um, to either, you know, a soup kitchen or a shelter in need and having that be like a fun activity that your family does together. And, you know, to, again, to kind of some of these themes about gratitude and service, um, giving back is, I think, m perhaps more important this year for those that need it, but then also those of us that feel very stuck in this kind of awful COVID situation. Um, so with that kind of drive by canned, can which I love, um, I'm going to do that, I think, with my, my <laughs> family. But that can be adapted to um, a coat drive, right? Um, you know, it could, it, be, it really could be adapted to anything that you are finding the need in your family. There's an organization called the Bridgeport Rescue Mission. Um, that's an, an amazing organization in Bridgeport. They're, they're trying to do a coat drive currently, right? So, you know, finding things in your community that you can do and people, you can be the hub and people can drop off really important kind of Thanksgiving um, mission. One of the other ones I loved was, um, I read this in the Wall Street Journal actually last night, which I was like, oh, that's a very creative idea. Expensive perhaps, but creative. Um, this guy talked about doing a, um, um, like a tailgate, a Thanksgiving tailgate. Um, so every, he's getting a big grill, he's putting up heat lamps and everyone's coming outside and they're just, they're not even doing Thanksgiving. They're doing like hot dogs, hamburgers, like a really, like a, like honest to goodness, a, a tailgate in the backyard, um, where people are just coming for pockets of time, um, and wearing full coats and, and gloves and hats. And they're being together for a half hour. They're stop, you know, they're stopping and getting their plate of food and then they're, they're moving on. So again, I think some of it is can't. Is there the opportunity to do things outside? Um, does that maybe look like doing a fire pit dessert, right? Where, you know, if you have families that are local, everyone brings their dessert at, you know, 7.30, um, their own dessert. You're not, you know, you're not sharing between families. You sit around the fire pit, you have a glass of wine, have a dessert, and that's your 30 minutes of connection with your family, right? Um, the other one I really loved was a mini pie contest. And, and again, some of these are really specific if you do have local families or neighborhoods or friends, you know, these some of these can be for friends giving sorts of things. Um, you know, you can get those little mini pie dishes from Amazon. Each family bakes their own five pies in the little mini dishes, you hand deliver them, and then you have a virtual contest while everyone shares dessert and you vote and someone gets a prize, right? Something like that. Silly, but perhaps cute you know I don't know me I, I suggested this and it failed but you know for some families it may work um I also love the idea of kind of a twist on a potluck meal so I, I imagine there's going to be a lot of families that kind of have a virtual component they're zooming in with their families at some point uh, if they can't be together and so um the potluck rather than food based would be a picture or a memory um of some sort to kind of foster conversation and connection via that Zoom. A lot of, as we know, a lot of Zoom meetings can be very all over the place. <laughs> and um, sometimes kind of having a purpose to that Zoom connection, if you will, um, can be really meaningful and just also help foster that connection. You know, so everyone brings their fam favorite family memory or favorite family photo, a funny story, whatever it may be, um, can really kind of be, be build, build connection, if you will. Um, I also really liked um, creating a family gratitude chain. Um, so from now until Thanksgiving, you know, those paper chains, um, you know, in your in your home, write down on each paper, have everyone in your family write something they're grateful for, or thankful for, right, and you create a gratitude chain with your kids. And then on Thanksgiving, during your meal, you read that aloud. Um, you know, something just kind of very purposeful. Mm -hmm. and to kind of point the direction more to acknowledging what we still have and the things that are still good in our lives um, can be a really important thing to do with kids in families when we will undoubtedly miss so much of, of, of what we normally experience. 
Absolutely. And then moving into kind of like winter and Christmas time, um, some of my favorites were, I know a lot of us send Christmas cards and we kind of just like send it out in mass, um, but kind of focusing a little more on individual letters to people and sharing that throughout the holiday season. I really love that one. Um, indoor or outdoor, you can do a candy cane or a chocolate coin hunt with your kids. Uh, and Christmas carols and hot chocolate. You can still do that inside on Zoom with family members. Um, and it's just a fun way to still be able to connect with people and, and do a fun activity. And so, you know, again, focusing on some of the traditions that we have from holidays past and revamping them a little bit um, for this year, not trying to exactly mirror what it's always looked like, um, but a little bit of a creative twist to things. The, the candy cane hunt was a, a definitely a very cute one for little ones. Um, I know a lot of people for Halloween did like a scavenger hunt with Halloween candy. It's kind of playing off that theme of, you know, finding candy canes around your house um, with cousins, what have you. And then maybe that leading to like a Christmas Eve box of like, you know, Christmas jammies or something like that. Right. So something kind of just creative to um, to instill some kind of fun and creativity in a time that might feel a little bit dry and, and sad at times, right? Um, I think one of the things for Christmas and Thanksgiving I really love is really creating the holiday more so in your in your home. And so if we're all gonna be home, maybe we decorate earlier, right? Maybe we really make, we make popcorn garland or snowflakes or bring back, you know, paper chains to on the Christmas tree, things like that, that can really get your kids involved in, in decorating, making your home feel very special, perhaps more so than it usually does. Mm -hmm. um, I also love the idea of silly stockings. Um, you know, I think there undoubtedly will, be sadness at, at some of these holidays, right? And so sometimes shifting that focus to something can be really important, right? So your stock, if you do stockings or if you've never done stockings before, making that kind of like like gag stockings, like silly, silly stockings filled with things that on Christmas morning will bring a little bit of joy and laughter to the room rather than the focus being on what will is missing, if that makes sense. And along the same lines, even involving your kids a little more, you know, if you're sending gifts to loved ones um, in a different state or a different town, kind of including your kids in that and helping them pick out whatever that gift may be, help, having them help you wrap it. And when you, you can maybe even do like a secret Santa over Zoom. And when those people are opening the gifts, the kids are a little bit more connected because they had a hand in helping versus maybe just buying the gifts and sending them and not involving the kids at all, which is easier but this holiday season, it can be really helpful to kind of include them a bit more. I also love the idea of an ornament swap. So um, if we all can't, in this kind of plays on like a, a traditional cookie swap, right? If we're not gonna do cookie swaps, maybe you do a recipe swap for cookies instead of an actual cookie swap, right? Um, but an ornament swap, you know, you pick a group of your 15 best friends or neighbors or family members, whatever, pick names out of hat and, each per, you deliver on a certain day um, a beautiful ornament to the doorstep, right? It's a nice way of just people to feel um, like they're getting something, you know, nice and connected and holiday, um, but in a way that's contactless, if that, if that makes sense. Um, a lot of questions around like, well, what, where will my kids see Santa this year? Um, you know, what's happening there? There's a great website called um, jingle ring, which um, I think actually you have to pay for, but it's a virtual um, Santa meeting, meet and greet. Um, you know, I think in the coming weeks in terms of Christmas, there'll be a lot of other things that come up that different communities are doing. Um, I know, you know, the Bass Pro Shop in, in Bridgeport is going to be doing like a um, Santa is going to be like in a globe, you know, so the kids can go masked, but he'll be in a, you know, protected globe, right? That's creative in some ways. And I think we'll see more of that as time goes on. There's, um, I've already seen a couple different things on some of the moms groups and things like that around some virtual um, light events, you know, mm -hmm. in different parts of the, of the state um, that could be really interesting to kind of attend. Um, not something maybe you would have done last year, but maybe this year you really make an effort to do something like that, just to feel more in the holiday spirit. I don't, I don't see any things in the chat, but I'm one, oh, I see one. Oh yeah, okay, so, so you guys are trying to do photos with Santa on 1120. 
which is great. There you go. Um, other, other ideas that you and your families have talked about or going to be doing, um, I, I think we all learn from each other. So I certainly don't want to pretend that Julie and I are the only one with uh, Pinterest worthy ideas here, but <laughs> does anybody else have thoughts or conversations that they've had with their own families about the holidays so far? That's okay. That's what the purpose of today is, right? We're supposed to give you these ideas. <laughs> and I will tell you that there's a there's a bunch of ideas that Stacy will send out. We're just kind of naming a few of them. Um, I also think it's, you know, often we don't focus on New Year's Eve, um, but I think this year in particular, New Year's could be a really important um, holiday, perhaps even more so than, than the other holidays. Mm -hmm. And maybe you focus in your families a little bit more on kind of bringing in 2021, right? Um, identifying and kind of acknowledging so much of what we've endured as families um, in 2020 um, on so many levels, right? Um, one of the things I love that I've never done for my own because it's effort and who, who <laughs> I'm always exhausted, right? But it is a great idea. Um, creating a popsicle jar or a jar with popsicle sticks. And on New Year's Eve, each family member takes five popsicle sticks and they write down the things that they really missed about 2020 that they're really hoping to do in 2021. Right. So really focusing on and then on a rainy day or um, a weekend in which you have no plans, you guys are choosing some of those popsicle sticks and within reason for what makes sense. You know, not every kid's going to have good ideas there, but you know what I mean, that it's, it's kind of creating this this idea that we can still revisit and do things that we really missed out on in 2020. Mm -hmm. And I think my favorite New Year's Eve idea was definitely the vision board, which I think is something people do even pre-pandemic, um, but just kind of saving old magazines, newspapers, anything you guys have laying around and just kind of cutting things out for the new year, um, things you kind of want to manifest or hope come true in 2021, uh, things to look forward to. And that's always fun because you can kind of just like spread it out on a big table. Sometimes we really do those as individual vision boards, you know, a lot of times that they can be very helpful for individuals, but I think creating a family one can be really um really, really cute and, and, and fun for a family. Um, I, you know, sometimes the other thing um, for New Year's really is, well, this is kind of, again, I, who has time to do this? But if you do have time to do this, creating a time capsule of things <laughs> The Pinterest, I think, is full of wonderful ideas and also like, holy moly, who has time to do some of these things? It's wild to me when I when I browse Pinterest, but they are very creative. And in so kind of creating a time capsule, like a 2020 time capsule, there's so many things that have occurred this year that will change us and um, in our things that we won't necessarily have to deal with in the future. And so I think really honoring that and acknowledging that as a way to kind of put it to rest and to kind of put us put it behind us a little bit um, and to honor it in some weird way can be really um, healing in, in some ways for, for families and for kids, you know, acknowledging how difficult the year has been and putting that in a, in a time capsule, if you will. So any kind of questions or comments about any of these holiday ideas? Chelsea, you touched on something that I think we can all relate to in terms of time, right? And how do we find that time? Do you have any tips for busy parents, families on how to schedule or find that time to do some of these wonderful activities that you're um, sharing with us? Yeah, no, Stacey, I appreciate that. Um, I have no time, so I have no idea when I'm going to be doing any of these. I, I'm leaving that for all of you. No, I'm kidding. Um, you know, for me, it's about being planned. It's about kind of taking a look at this holiday playbook and picking the two or three things that maybe you think you want to do as a family and then creating a time in which you really do that, right? Um, because I think the reality is we're all moving at warp speed, right? There's so many things going on in all of our lives that to say that, you know, for me, if I don't choose or identify something with my husband that I want to do on a Saturday, it doesn't happen, right? Because the day just 
occurs and, and a million things are going on and I have to clean the toilets, you know, whatever it is, right? But for real, I mean, I think it's really important to just identify the one or two or three things that might, um, you know, feel good to you guys as a family and then choose almost writing it in the calendar, right? Yeah. That's my biggest advice is, is I think if things are not planned or agreed upon that they don't really happen because we all don't have time. I think it's also, if you think back to the beginning of the pandemic, which feels light years away, we did have more time open up a little bit. You know, things were shut down, things were canceled. We had more time as a family. And so how do we kind of go back to that a little bit? Um, as a society, we've kind of normalized what we're going through right now. And we've kind of picked up right back to that pace we were at pre-COVID. How do we kind of dial it back for this holiday season and realize if the holidays aren't going to look like they normally look like, and if I'm not running around buying a million gifts, and if we're not cooking a huge dinner, if I don't have to clean my house to host 30 people, what am I doing with that time? So realizing and kind of taking stock of the things that are going to look different, thinking about how much time that would have taken you and allowing yourself to allot that time for something else. Because it's so easy when you have kids to then fill that time with all the things that keep you so busy every day. But taking stock of what you would have been doing um, and again, kind of like reallocating that time. Um, because we do, the time within reason is there. It's just a matter of planning and executing and moving forward in it, moving forward with it in a really like meaningful and present way. So much easier said than done. But I think when we kind of, you know, acknowledge how different it is going to look this year and the free time that you are inevitably going to have from things you would have been running around all the hustle and bustle doing, um, it may be a little bit helpful way to look at it. And in some of that lies giving yourself permission to acknowledge that the holidays are going to look and feel different, right? I mean, I think that's kind of like the first step in all of this is just really acknowledging that it's okay that your kids and your families will experience a somewhat different mm -hmm. holiday than they normally do. Maybe that's a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and maybe some new little traditions can kind of come, come from this time. Yeah. Um, I think the... Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, in talking about time, Chelsea and Julianne, how um, can you talk a little bit about the importance of finding time with your spouse or your partner and trying to balance that with family time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Save the best oh, for last. Beautiful <laughs> answer for that. <laughs> it's interesting because kind of as helping professionals, it's it's this really interesting time where we are experiencing things on the societal level that the people we work with are also experiencing. So in asking that question, Chelsea and I are like, we're also dealing with that, which is a good thing because we're kind of able to share this like common um common theme and common advice with one another. But I think, and I'm sure Chelsea can speak to this as well, it's really carving out that time. It's, it's almost like we are afraid to slow down because we're almost, we're worried what that's going to bring. And so even when that time does open up, we're so quick to fill it because that's all we know. We're so hustle and bustle. We're so on to the next thing, onto the next thing, but kind of taking stock, moving into the holidays, What's important? What isn't? What is a priority? What's not a priority? What's our end goal here? What What do we want to accomplish as a family throughout this holiday season? And how do we kind of hunker down a little bit, make a plan for that, and make sure we're keeping that in mind? And it could even be something as like a mantra or a family motto that you're hanging up in your kitchen, somewhere you see it every day, like, it's okay to slow down or prioritize family, whatever that looks like for you and your family and your loved ones, but just a simple reminder that each day, slowing down a little bit, giving your permission, giving yourself permission to do so can be really helpful and important. And I also just think communication, right, is is in, in some ways the key, I think, to any healthy relationship in, in family. Um, if my husband and I don't communicate, we'll go days without ever really having a meaningful conversation because we're just so busy, right? You know, we literally sat this weekend, we decided to have, well, I can't have a glass of wine because I'm pregnant, but he had a glass of wine outside in our backyard and we just sat together while our little guy was taking a nap, right? I mean, 
choosing to have these moments of connection, I think is part of this theme um, that even though things look really different and really crazy, um, choosing and communicating about ways to connect mm -hmm. um, and speaking about that early and clearly within your own families and your extended families is, is really crucial. Yeah. And it almost like it, this sentence feels a little aggressive, like we're gearing up for something, but the holidays are going to be difficult. So even setting aside time for either you and your partner or you and your whole family and, and acknowledging this and saying, we might be feeling this, it goes back to what we were saying in the beginning of the presentation, kind of acknowledging and naming all of this, you know, the holidays are going to look different. It's going to be a little bit tough. We're here. And how do we kind of make the most of our time together? And that could even be you and your partner kind of having one-on-one -on -one time with, with each of your kids or, or doing a family outing, something kind of like regrouping and moving through the holiday season together as a unit. I think it's really kind of the last piece of what Julianne and I really want to kind of just mention here is, is the ability to kind of find strength and hope as we move forward in this holiday season and through in, in, in throughout this COVID pandemic experience. It's, I think, so easy for all of us to get lost in the craziness of all of this. And truthfully, and I self-admit this, it has been a wild situation, right? For many families, really, really stressful, has pushed me and my husband to our own limits, our children. And I think it's really important to, again, acknowledge that, view it through a grief lens, name it, um, give permission for those feelings within your families and have those conversations. But then also try to then, how can we find the little silver linings? How can we make new um, traditions? And how, how can we focus and bring our families into a place of resilience and perspective um, even though things have been really, really hard. Not easy and very challenging, but I think it's, um, it's important, I think, as parents to lead by example by way of that. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in Stacey, to, to, to kind of your comment, then to have that conversation with your husband or to have, you know, so that your kids see you and your husband having a, a drink outside and, and saying, you guys have to watch a movie. We're not going to talk to you for an hour, right? I mean, whatever it may be, you know, it, leading by example is, is, is huge, I think, in this time. And the other piece that flows into this is, leading by example in the way that we're caring for ourselves. And so, um, Julianne, you always say this really beautifully because I it, something that I learned in this process is the difference between self-soothing and self-care. Um, yeah. Self-care can be an incredibly annoying buzzword, especially in times of hardship. And um, mm -hmm. I really actually hate that word because I think it in, instills pressure on us as parents and moms and families to like take care of ourselves. And what does that mean in a time when there's a million things going on? So Julian, you, I love how you say this. Yeah. Thank you. That's so kind. Uh, so I think probably what, do it better than me. So <laughs> what Kelsey was touching upon is the importance to model this. And when we are so busy and so go, 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 and we're not taking a moment for ourselves, our kids are picking up on that. And so while we may think or feel or know that we don't have the time for certain things, it's really important to model this for our kids and let them know that it's okay to rest. Rest isn't something that we have to earn. It's something that we are allowed to do. Um, and so self-care is really a proactive action. During the pandemic, it's okay if your self-care looks like survival. It's okay if it looks like getting something on the table for dinner. It's okay if it looks like making sure the bills are paid. It's okay if it makes sure if it's doing the laundry and making sure that the house is, you know, functioning in a way where people can online learn, work from home and do all of this within our space. That's what self-care really is. It's those proactive and preventative actions, survival. Self-soothing is what the media has kind of taken over as this self-care and is constantly like guilting us into doing it, even though many of us feel and know that we don't have the time for it. And that's kind of the reactive action. Once the damage is already done, we've hit our limit, we can't go on any longer, the burnout is happening, the stress is there. That's what the media shows us self-care is, the massages, the manicures, the you know, meditations and podcasts and audiobooks and 
everything we wish we had time for. But knowing that self-care can look like survival and that it's okay to rest is what I hope to be the biggest takeaway from all of this. Modeling that for your kids, giving yourself permission to do so, and knowing that it's okay if you don't always have the time and capacity for it. Um, and don't let anyone make you feel guilty already on top of everything you have going on for maybe not having the time. So it's something that you fit in when you can, but just kind of acknowledging that difference and what are we doing so we can carry on with our day? And then what are we doing so I can make it through the entire week? is how I kind of like to think about it. In the in the self-soothing, right? The taking a bath, going for a walk, listening to music, meditating, um, journaling, uh, creating a gratitude list, whatever it is that you do in your life to take care of yourself, mm -hmm. really classifying that more self-soothing, right? That those self-soothing moments occur when and if I have time, um, and I should make, try to make time for those things. Mm -hmm. But if the only thing I'm doing during a pandemic is surviving, that is that self-care is enough, right? Yes. That's kind of the message, if, if that makes sense. And especially during the holidays, because they will be hard. Yes. But we're hoping that, um, we're hope, you know, I think the hope of this presentation really was to, to frame what we're all going through in a different way. Um, to bring kind of light to kind of this grief lens and collective loss and um, talk about the communication pieces and how imperative that is for the upcoming holidays, um, focusing on your nuclear family, um, really discussing honestly and openly with your own families and your extended families, the different ideas for the holidays, and then trying to kind of pick and choose one or two things um, that may help bring a little bit more joy and a little bit more laughter to the holiday season for you and your families in what will undoubtedly be a very challenging and hard holiday season for some families, some more than others, right? Um, and also the other piece I want to really say here too is it's also important, I think we can be very judgy as a society um, in terms of what other neighbors and families are doing, right? You have control over what you and your family do, right? And that is what's most vital and important. If your neighbors choose to have 50 people at their house, don't see them for a couple couple days, right? But that's not something you can control. Mm -hmm. I had a client recently who I see individually, she's a wonderful woman and she is enraged that every time she goes to the grocery store or to a store, there's people that are not masked or there's people that are, you know, bringing their kit, whatever it is, right? And really what I'm trying to help her with is like, what can you control though, right? Like you can't control, like whether or not that's correct is, it's bringing more pain to your life, right? And so the reality is there's gonna be many families that celebrate differently. And you may not agree with every family's decisions and that's okay, right? Focus on what you can do that feels safe and celebratory and good and joyful in your own families. Absolutely. Kind of extending yourself the same grace that you would extend others and prioritizing your family unit and knowing that whatever decision you make is okay, because it's a decision you're making for your family. And if your mother-in-law is angry with you, that's okay. That's about her. That's <laughs> not about you. At least that's what I'm telling myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I, any, any other thoughts or questions? Um, please know that Julianne and I are here anytime. You know, as, as Stacy mentioned, we work for Family Centers and the Center for Hope in the Denver Grieving Kids. Um, on the holiday playbook is our contact information. And so if you have any grief needs or therapy needs, or you want to be part of a group or have any questions, please really, we mean this, don't hesitate to reach out. It's a very difficult time for people. Um, and please know that there's support available and that we'd love to hear from you if and when appropriate. Thank you, Chelsea and Julianne, for this wonderful conversation. And thank you all for joining us this morning. I hope you can take what Chelsea and Julianne shared with us and find the joy in your holidays and um, make them special. So thank you again, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank, thank you, everyone. You. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you.